Good evening to everyone and welcome to our shortened carol service tonight. And uh, those of you who are uh, here in the building with us are especially uh, welcome. And there might be some folks watching online at home as well. Uh, obviously, we're not uh, putting the sound out in the car park. So if there's anybody parked in a car park listening to me, uh, they'll have to have very good hearing. I just want to... Um, repeat one or two of the announcements from uh, this morning, and that's just to say that uh, the Christmas morning service will be at 10.30. That's on Saturday, of course. And then we will have a service on Sunday morning as uh, normal, maybe a bit shorter than our normal service, but nonetheless. And then the covenant service after that. Uh, I had said, we had said at the church council uh, a week or two ago um, that we would hope to start having evening services again uh, maybe starting in the middle of January. Um, but of course, that depends on the situation with regards to COVID. So assuming that uh, the rules uh, don't change and who knows what might happen at an executive meeting this week, uh, you never know. They, can't, they could possibly tell us we can't meet on Christmas morning. Who knows? Uh, but we'll follow the rules that are given to us. Um, but assuming that that's possible, I am hoping that uh, in the middle of January or perhaps a week after that, uh, we will have um, evening services uh, at the normal time of six o'clock. Uh, they'll be shorter than perhaps a, a, an evening service. It'll be just some hymns and some prayers and something from God's Word to encourage us and strengthen us and build us up. Uh, so that's the intention. And then the one other thing to say is that the loose offering this evening will be added to the loose offering on Christmas morning. Uh, Isabel and I decided that this morning, that we would add in tonight's offering together with Christmas morning for our Methodist Child Care Society. Uh, there isn't uh, a watch night service planned, so there won't be a watch night service this year. Now, uh, you don't have the full order printed out for you. You have the hymns on your sheet. Uh, they will be on the screen, of course. Uh, we just have... Uh, the one reader uh, is going to read four of the lessons for us. I'll read the final one. And uh, so Nikki's going to read from here. Amanda's going to lead our singing uh, from over there. And uh, I will stay in my uh, comfortable little pulpit here all by myself. I had said to Nikki, we could, but it'd be a bit of a tight squeeze for the two of us. Uh, uh, it's not a very big pulpit here. So uh, our opening um, carol then, uh, Once in Royal David City.
and let us pray. O God, we turn once more towards Bethlehem. Help us to find Christ for ourselves. Through the fears and darkness of the world, where our feet would stumble, we come to him who is the way. Through our selfishness and greed that so often clouds our lives, we seek him who is the truth. Through the superstitions and commercialism that would smother Christmas, we struggle to find Christ who is the life. Help us, Lord, to find our way through the busyness and self-indulgence of life, to bow before you and worship you. Don't allow us to waste another Christmas and miss the point again. Grant us light to see where we have gone wrong, courage to face our faults, love strong enough to set wrongs right. As we recall your coming and as we sing your praise, may our worship be a new beginning for us. May Christ be born afresh in us. May we become, in truth, a part of your great family of faith throughout the whole world. Through him who has come to us and through whom we have come to you. In Jesus' name, amen. And our first reading is from Isaiah chapter 9. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. You have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest, as men rejoice when dividing the plunder. For as in the day of Midian's defeat, you have shattered the yoke that burdens them, the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor. Every warrior's boot used in battle and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning, will be fuel for the fire. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace." Of the increase of his government and peace there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. And we'll all sing together in the bleak midwinter.
Next reading from Luke chapter 2, verses 1 to 7. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place whilst Quirinius was governor of Syria. And everyone went to his own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. And we'll sing then, Away in a manger, no crib for a bed. The story in Luke's Gospel continues from verse 8 to 20. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today, in the town of David, a saviour has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to men on whom his favour rests. When the angels had left them, and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby, who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. 
But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. In our prayers, uh, <coughs> in our prayers for other folks tonight, I want to uh, focus on a couple of things. And first of all, I want to pray for the Dar Hamid people of Sudan. Uh, some of you have been using this little booklet through the month. Uh, some of you, uh, a particular month has been kind of designated to you to pray. Uh, others of us maybe have just been picking it up now and then and, uh, and praying for uh, the people. And we've heard a bit about them through this little booklet. And I want to pray that this Christmas uh, will be a time when some of these people will hear, and some of them perhaps for the first time, uh, hear the story of Christmas and be able to understand the significance of it. <clears throat> and then I want to pray for brothers and sisters in Christ who are suffering persecution around the world. And it just so happened that uh, this afternoon sitting at my computer, an email came in from uh, the uh, Voice of the Martyrs, uh, which is a Christian organization that I get emails from uh, from time to time, uh, encouraging prayer uh, and working with people who are uh, suffering persecution in various parts of the world. And uh, just one of the appeals that they were um, highlighting in this email was to help widows in Nigeria. And there's this little story. It's not a very nice story in a way, and you think, well, why on earth are you reading that at the carol service? You know, we should be. Um, but uh, in our prayers, this is what I hope um, we will think uh, about. Here's the, here's the short story. Uh, We've got a big infidel, the Boko Haram fighter shouted from inside Juliana's house. Her heart sank as she watched them drag her husband out of the door. Do you, not, do you renounce Christ? One fighter asked him. Will you follow us? Juliana's husband remained silent. Jesus, Juliana cried in anguish. The Boko Haram fighters then slapped her and ordered her husband to lie down on the ground. They shot him four times chanting Alu Akbar as they circled his body before moving on to the next Christian house in the village. Juliana knelt beside her husband, cradling his head in her lap. She wanted to hold him one last time before he took his final breath. After her husband's death, there was nothing left for Juliana and her children in their village. So she buried his body, gathered her children, and left. They walked three days before reaching a camp for internally displaced people that included both Christians and Muslims who had lost their homes and loved ones for opposing Boko Haram. In the camp, Juliana heard about the Voice of the Martyrs supported training center for widows where she could receive discipleship training and learn how to run her own business. Boko Haram had killed her husband, made her a widow, and left her children fatherless. But they couldn't make her deny Christ. They couldn't take away her hope or separate her from the wider body of Christ. Let's pray. Our gracious God, we think today of those who are suffering for the sake of Christ. And this one very moving story touches us deeply. And yet, Lord, it is but one story from one place. And there are many similar stories from Myanmar and uh, other parts of the world, as well as different parts of, of Africa, like uh, the story from northern Nigeria. We pray, O oh God, that you will comfort this dear lady and all those others like her who have lost their husbands, perhaps some of their children, perhaps their brothers, their fathers, lost their homes, lost their livelihoods, have had to flee for their lives. We thank you for the work of various Christian and other organizations 
providing support to such people, enabling them to find safer places to live, to find a new form of employment to provide for themselves. We pray for those, Lord, who have crossed borders fleeing in order to find safety. And Lord, when we uh, read uh, the, the, uh, the nativity story, of course, we are reminded that Mary and Joseph fled with their newborn child across the border and into Egypt to escape uh, the murderous intent of Herod. And so, Lord, give us hearts of compassion and sympathy for those who are refugees, for whatever reason, but particularly for those who have suffered because of their faithfulness to the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, we pray for the Dar Hamid people of Sudan, uh, Muslim people with very little contact with the gospel. But we pray, O oh God, that perhaps there will be some in that tribe who at this time of the year will perhaps hear the story of the birth of the Lord Jesus, the Son of God, the Savior of the world, and that they might recognize in him the one true prophet and the only Savior of sinners, and that they might turn to him and find new life and hope, and that they might then share that news with others in their tribe. And finally, Lord, we pray for our own church family, and you know uh, the various needs that there are. Uh, there are some of our members who are in hospital or who are waiting for treatment, uh, some who are ill, some who are old, some who are young, all kinds of different circumstances and situations, and you know each one. Some of the situations perhaps are, are known to quite a few of us, um, others are situations that very few know about. But we thank you, Lord, that you know them all. And you know every secret anxiety and fear in our own hearts and the worries that we carry day to day. Help us, Lord, to leave that burden with you, to give over to you our cares and concerns, knowing that worrying won't uh, make one bit of difference, but that you can, you can help us and you can be the answer to whatever our needs might be. And so we lay them at your feet in prayer. Together with these people that we've been thinking about uh, throughout the world. And ask that at this Christmas season there would be joy and hope. As the good news of Jesus is recognized by more and more people. And even those perhaps who at this time are enemies of the gospel and enemies of Christ and murdering Christians, and trying to get them to uh, blaspheme the name of Jesus. Lord, even those folks we pray for, and ask that you would draw them to the cross. So, Lord, hear and answer these prayers. And we conclude our prayers as we join together with the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And our next reading is from Matthew's Gospel and chapter 2. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, where is the one who's been born King of the Jews? We saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them, where the Christ was to be born. In Bethlehem, in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you will come a ruler who will be the shepherd of my people Israel. 
Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and make a careful search for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me, so that I too may go and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen in the east went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold and of incense and of myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. And we'll sing together, Silent Night. John chapter 1 and verse 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world. And though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, 
but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become the children of God, children born not of natural descent, nor human decision, nor a husband's will, but born of God. The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. I was going to say I'd like to thank all the people who've been reading, but uh, really it's just kind of her and me. Um, but thank you to Amanda for leading our singing, not just tonight, but for many months now, and Rebecca at the organ, or when she's normally at the piano, and the techie guys at the back, and all who contribute uh, to our service tonight, and indeed throughout uh, the, the months. Uh, you don't have it on your order of service, you just have the hymn uh, things, but uh, I did... Um, type this out and send it around to various people who get it, and it says the reflection instead of sermon. So um, you might be thinking that a reflection is much shorter than a sermon. Um, and um, my initial intent had been, yes, it would be. I had a little idea in my head of what I was going to do. It was basically based on a, um, a previous uh, thought of the day. Uh, you'll get that at some point. Don't worry about it. Uh, but something else popped into my mind. And strangely, it popped into my mind at about six o'clock this morning. Now, I went to bed very early yesterday. I had a migraine yesterday at tea time, and uh, I had a double one. It kind of, uh, so I, I just went to bed and uh, fell asleep with um, some of the, the tablets I'd taken. And uh, I did wake up a few times. But I woke up at six or before five o'clock, actually, and I, and I was listening to the radio I quite often have the radio. I have Radio 4 on all night sometimes, and I listen to the world service. And uh, if I wake up, then I just listen and doze off again. Um, sometimes when the cricket's on, I listen to the cricket. But England had been playing so badly, uh, I hadn't the heart to listen to the cricket. So I was listening to Radio 4, and uh, there was a program. It is, it's a repeat because it had been on uh, first broadcast on the 13th of December. Uh, it's a program I sometimes listen to. Uh, it's called Something Understood, and uh, this one was done by Mark Tully. Other people do it as well, uh, but he, uh, they, they, they take a theme and they kind of explore it and, and go around different areas and use readings and poetry and songs and, and, and talk about it. It's, it's quite an interesting, but it struck me as I was um, listening. I'm going to read just a little blurb about the program from the, uh, the BBC Sounds app, which I have on my, my phone here. And it says this, um, uh, in the season of Advent, Mark Tully asks what we can learn from the stories of Christmas as we prepare for it in an increasingly secular society. Many of those who will crowd into churches for midnight mass or other services at Christmas will find it difficult to believe the gospel stories literally or to accept the traditional views of Jesus as God come down to earth. But they might well be so moved by the liturgy, the carols, their memories of Christmas past, the sense that this is one day when the world does stop and they wish they could find some meaning in Christmas, in the Christmas story. Mark Tully explores the idea that regarding the story as myth can give meaning to Christmas without belief in the traditional Christology. So that was the theme of the program, and they had various people on it uh, exploring this idea that the Christmas stories, uh, that they're, they're myths. Now, you need to understand what they mean by the word myth. If, if I said to you, uh, um, such and such told me such, and I think it's a myth, um, maybe, your, maybe your grandchildren have come with a sob story about uh, uh, why uh, they're in such a muck um, and they'll tell you a story, and you'll think, well, that sounds like a myth. Um, and what you mean by that is it's, it's just basically a pack of lies. Uh, you know, it's not true. You couldn't, couldn't believe a word that comes out of some people's mouths. Uh, I was nearly going to mention a politician, but I better not. Um, uh, and you say, well, that's, that's, that's just myth. 
Now, that's one way to, to use the word, I suppose. But that's not what Mark Tully means in this program. And it's not what the theologians mean when they say that such and such thing was a myth. What they mean is it's a, it's a rather clever story. And whilst the story itself is not true, there's a message in it that might be true. And, uh, for example, you have got famous um, fables. Aesop um, wrote fables, stories. Now, whether any of the stories were um, literally true or not, I don't know. I, I, certainly some of them weren't. Uh, they were just things that he imagined. But there was a kind of a message um, in them. Now, listen carefully to what Peter says. Sorry, I didn't give the guys the reference for this to put on the screen, but let me read it for you. Uh, 2 Peter, chapter 1, and verse 16. Peter says, We did not follow cleverly devised stories when we told you about the coming of our Lord, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. And then he goes on. Thanks, there's the, there's the verse in the NIV. Uh, he goes on to talk about the transfiguration. And he said, we were on the, the holy mountain, and we heard with our ears, and we saw, and we touched. We, we were there. It was real. This wasn't a story that we invented. Now, uh, if you look at that, that's the NIV we have on the screen there and what I read. Um, other translations uh, translate the word stories, fables, tales, uh, cunningly devised, invented, uh, the uh, English Standard Version is probably the most helpful, and it translates it, cleverly devised myths. And the Greek word actually is uh, the word muthos, from which we get in English our word myth. All right? So Peter is telling his readers that they did not follow cunningly devised myths. They were actually there on the mountain. And uh, he's talking particularly about the second coming of the Lord Jesus. And that's not a myth, he says. Now, Peter understood perfectly well what a myth was. I mean, the Greeks were brilliant at writing myths. Uh, you have Norse myths and all kinds of other mythologies, Irish mythologies as well. Uh, so the idea of a story that tells you something that uh, might, be, might be true, has a message in it, but that the, the story itself is not actually true. And nobody really intends you to, to take it um, literally. That's not what the stories about the birth of Christ are about. Peter... Uh, would have not been in Nazareth when Jesus was growing up. Neither would John, nor Mark, nor Matthew. But they did talk to people who were. And particularly, I guess, uh, the key source of information would have been the Virgin Mary herself. And Mary would have told the story uh, the tradition is that uh, the Apostle John looked after Mary in her old age. You remember at the cross, Jesus commended Mary to John's care and keeping, and John looked after her. Uh, and John lived to be an old man. And obviously, Mary um, died before that. Um, so he knew all her stories. And they weren't myths. It actually happened like this. The second thing I want to say, I have only two things to say. Uh, the second thing is, there's another story, which again, uh, we haven't time to read, um, but uh, you'll be familiar with it. In Luke uh, chapter 1, I'll preach on this sometime. I'll preach through the whole beginning of Luke, and we'll go through this again. But uh, uh, the story of uh, the foretelling of the birth of John the Baptist. Uh, his father was a man called Zechariah, married to a, an elderly lady called Elizabeth. Happened to be a cousin of Mary's, but uh, that's by the way. Uh, Zechariah was a priest. And it so happened that it was his turn to be on duty in the temple. Uh, they cast lots, and so there was kind of a rota made, and the priests would be on duty for a certain length of time. And it was a very important time for them. Uh, you know, when they were 
on call, on duty, to, to lead the prayers of the people. They would go into the temple, and they would burn the incense, and they would tend the showbread, and, and they would stand before the veil. Uh, the Holy of Holies was the other side. They weren't allowed in there, of course. Uh, but they would stand, they would burn incense at the little altar, they would trim the candles, the, the light would shine, and they would offer prayers to Almighty God, who symbolically was behind the curtain, and uh, incense wafted through the veil, as it were, carrying the prayers of the people. That was the symbolism of it. And the priest would pray the prayers on behalf of the people. Very important uh, task that Zechariah had. And on this occasion, he was on duty, and he was in the temple. And lo and behold, the angel Gabriel appeared. And uh, Gabriel um, told him some stuff. He says, I am um, Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, and I have been sent uh, to speak to you and to tell you the good news. This is verse 20. Uh, 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 um, sorry, uh, let me go back for it. Before that, he said, You're going to, uh, Elizabeth's going to uh, have a baby. And uh, Zechariah says, How can this be? I'm an old man. And my wife was well along in years. That was verse 18. Then verse 19, the angel said, I'm Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, and I have been sent to tell you the good news. And then the next verse, put up verse 20 for us. And now you will be silent and not able to speak until the day this happens. Because you did not believe my word which will come true at the appointed time. It's a very powerful picture, isn't it? Of a religious cleric. Uh, he, I don't, well, I don't think he wore his collar back to front, but uh, he wore robes and uh, he, he had garb and, and, and there were, uh, he had training. Uh, this, this wasn't just a kind of um, summer job. Uh, being a priest on duty, uh, leading the prayers of the people was a very significant thing. And for someone in that position to hear directly from God through the archangel Gabriel, no less, and not to believe what God had said. I mean, can you imagine anything more serious than the priests of the people saying prayers for the people Hearing from an angel and saying, no, I doubt, that. I doubt that. I'm an old bloke, you know. <laughs> and she's not much younger either. Talking about his wife, not, not, not my wife. She, she, she's very young. <laughs> what a fitting judgment it was for God to strike Zechariah dumb until the time that it would happen. Now, you remember the rest of the story. There comes a time when, of course, um, John is born, and uh, there's a kerfuffle about what they'll call him, and uh, they want to call him Zechariah. Now, uh, I guess uh, John has, uh, Zechariah has been able to communicate with, um, with Elizabeth over the, over the months, uh, writing things down and so on. He's an educated man, so he can write. Uh, whether Elizabeth was educated enough to read it, but I guess she probably was. If she couldn't, then somebody else would have read what Zechariah had written, and uh, they were able to communicate. And when it came to, to naming the child, they were going to call him Zechariah, and Zechariah, who couldn't speak, him, mm, and they called for a, um, a writing tablets, and he wrote down, his name is John. Uh, in the months in between times, um, Zechariah had learnt his lesson. <laughs> Well, I guess it was pretty obvious when <clears throat> um, um, Elizabeth started to um, get a bit um, bigger. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then the child was born. Of course God's word had come true. Of course God's word can be believed. Literally. This wasn't a myth. This wasn't a cleverly invented fable or story to convey some possibly truthful message. This actually happened. And so, <clears throat> with all respect to um, Mark Tully and his team, I don't recommend you listen to the program. You're wasting your time. Uh, just take my word for it. <clears throat> but you can listen to it if you want. But remember that these stories that Nikki read for us and that you know so well about angels coming to Joseph and to Zechariah and to Mary 
and shepherds encountering angels on the hillsides, and wise men seeing a star and traveling, meeting Herod, the literal king in the palace who had murderous intent, and then going to find a house in Bethlehem and presenting him with gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. Very symbolic gifts. All of that is not some cleverly invented story, fable, or myth. It is true. And I believe it. Now, of course, all of these bits and pieces of the story, bits of it, I guess, sound a bit fantastical. But when you compare it, when you compare all of those things put together with the most important fundamental truth at the heart of the story, that God became a man. Now, don't ask me to explain uh, the genetics and the biology of all of it, because I don't know how God did it. The power of the Almighty overshadowed Mary, and she conceived, and what was in her womb was both human and divine. If that remarkable miracle, up until the coming, perhaps, of the resurrection, the biggest miracle in the universe, if that can be true, literally true, then all the other miracles that Jesus did, and the miracles throughout his life and at his birth and all of that, that's small beer. Uh, that's easy stuff. And so I don't have any difficulty in believing what Peter says when he says we didn't follow cleverly devised myths. We saw it. We heard it. We touched him. We were there. It was real. And so this Christmas story that we celebrate year after year, perhaps the often repeated elements of it make us a little bit blasé and over familiar with it. And we need to pause and just take it all in and wonder again at the marvel of the truth of all these stories that Christ was born of the Virgin Mary in Bethlehem. And it's true. And then we're going to sing Charles Wesley's hymn, a wonderful carol hark. The herald angels sing glory to the newborn king. Oh! 
And let us bless one another as we share the grace together. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen.